Good afternoon, everybody. Let me uh, do a few things here. Um, today's October the 14th, a Wednesday at noon. I uh, want to thank everybody for coming back and watching my show, uh, The Canine Man Show. Today's topic is going to be about raising the perfect puppy. Raising the perfect puppy. There's a lot to it. Now, I'm going to tell you guys, it's going to be a little more than an hour. Why? It's going to probably take me an hour to go over my stuff, but I really need to answer a lot of your questions and answers also. So very, very important. This is a very important topic. Why? You can ruin a puppy. You can ruin a puppy, which eventually is going to turn into a dog, older, older dog. You can mold him at a young age. You don't want to ruin him at a young age. You don't want to teach him bad habits. You don't want to, you don't want to do anything so stressful for him that it carries over to his whole career, his whole life. You don't want that. I've seen many dogs get ruined this way. I'll give you some evidence to this. I've seen dogs at the shelter get ruined. You can see what the owners have done to them. You can see what they've done to them. So it's very important that we know how to raise the puppy the right way so we can make him a great, great dog for the rest of our lives. This is supposed to be the honeymoon phase. This is supposed to be the fun stage of our life. And yet a lot of us really do the wrong thing to give the do these puppies a mixed message. So I wanna welcome everybody here. Barb, thanks for coming. Mar Margo, thanks again for joining me. Michael Butts. Thank you, Mike. Hope that dog's working out for you. Hey, Joe, I thought I seen you on here. I hope I did. Uh, Carrie, thanks for watching. I think you got a puppy or your boyfriend got a puppy. I, I could be wrong. But anyways, Carrie, thanks for watching. Uh, Steve Payne, thanks. There you go, Joe. Madison Barr, thanks. And I think your sidekick's with you, I hope. All right? <laughs> Tell her I said hi. Uh, Sandy, hi. Uh, thanks for watching, Carrie, Ray. And, uh, and go to my webpage, and. I posted my webpage on my comments, on my dog training flyers. Find the one on, about po uh, potty training. That will help you a lot. Although this show is gonna help you also at the same time. Uh, Marcy Nelson, thanks for watching. Brandy, um, thank you for being patient with me. I got, I'm getting really swarmed, uh, Brandy, with, uh, with some other things that I do. My public speaking is kicking back in again, and I'm getting a lot of calls from that. Uh, Danielle, thanks for watching. Let me see who said hi to me. Kelly Klein, thanks for watching. Now that you finally retired, Kelly, you can watch my show. Uh, Michelle White, thank you for watching. So today, again, the show is about how to raise a perfect puppy. You don't want to do anything that is going to ruin this dog, excuse me, this puppy into an adulthood. Very, very important. The number one issue I see around the country is going hands-on with a puppy going hands-on with a puppy, the number one issue. We need to stop teaching our puppies that our hands are weapons. And I don't care with anything. The only thing hands should be for is love. The only thing hands should be for is love. Puppies cannot handle stress. What do they do when they feel stressed? They internalize it. They go into survival mode. Their number one thing that they need from us is love because their instincts, in most cases, their instincts haven't evolved yet. So you need to give them love and teach them good habits. Boy, don't we need to do that with our kids? Love, love. Even more important, me as a father, my daughters, I need to show them an example of what love is so they know what it is. I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't want them to normalize bad love. I want them to know what good love is. No different than a puppy. I want the puppy to know that all humans are good. Hands are good hands are for loving you don't want them to learn and they learn it right at the young age eight six weeks old in potty training and when you rub their nose in their poop or you discipline them that stuff they don't really remember what they did wrong they just know that hands and especially maybe just men are mean i had a puppy in my class in my last obedience class he just turned five months old was a pit bull came in the first day terrified i couldn't come near him he growled at me it was imperative that I, I help this individual, the owner, teach this puppy that hands were good and therefore men are good. Very, very important. Laura Welch, thanks for watching. 
Uh, man, I hope your baby's good, uh, Laura. Man, what a cute baby. You and your husband sure make some cute babies. Uh, Jasmine, thanks for watching. Lisa, I'm glad you're watching. Carrie, thanks again for your, uh, Karis, thanks again for uh, coming back. Jessica, thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Have a five-month-old lab. Very good, Danielle. If you have any questions towards the end, Danielle, feel free. I'm hoping to answer everybody's questions in the show, in the show. And just remember, the number one is hands. Do not use your hands. What the hell do I do then, Hector? I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you with that. All right? Very, very important. Secondly, even as puppies, when you take them to the vet, be very careful they don't go hands-on and pin them down to the ground for, to get them checked or especially to cut their nails. Oh, my goodness, people. That, that's worse. Alpha roll, putting them on their back. Come on, really? You expect them to learn that, that, you're, that you're the boss that way? That's not the kind of respect I want to learn. It, it doesn't work. Now, my ego took me there when I first started. I, I give you that. But don't, don't think I haven't learned, you know, the, the, the right way to do things now, all right? So I got a text about my shirt. Listen, people, don't make fun of my shirt. It, I think it's appropriate for this, uh, for this show, all right? <laughs> so, so stop making fun of it. I won't tell you who did it, but they just texted me. Uh, Jessica, thanks for watching. Casey Wilcox, thanks for watching. So again, you guys, David Moldato. Uh-oh, David, we go back a long way, David. I hope you're doing well. Dave's got a good business on um, on transferring videos over to um, over to uh, MPG or formats. Very good. If you guys are interested in Sarah Terrell, thanks. Uh, I don't have a puppy, but I'm still interested. Seven-year-old pit bull. You know what, um, Sarah? That's a good point. A lot of the times, even an adult dog could have issues that you want to uh, ascertain on what you did wrong. So the next time you get a dog, you know, not to make the same mistake. Um, when I first started training, Sarah, my, my objective was to make as many mistakes as I could make so I don't make them again. So I don't make them again. Uh, Amanda, thanks for watching. Uh, again, uh, I have a four-month-old golden doodle. Can't wait to learn some tips and tricks. Very uh, good, 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 uh, Casey. You pick them up right now. Again, when I get done with this, feel free to, uh, if you have any questions, you guys, but let me, let me get through, let me get through it. Let me get through the show first. And then I got some good, if you guys got any questions, I can answer them. I'm gonna, I do my own producing, so it takes me a little longer to get through some slides. Um, so bear with me, bear with me. Okay, so listen, last week's topic, it was, uh, it, it, it was, it was on temperaments. I got a tremendous amount of feedback from it. Amazing how many people did not know what their dog temperament was, and yet they were experiencing other issues that they didn't know how to deal with. Um, I reverted them to my one-on-one -on -one, uh, private lessons. Uh, one of them, very, very important that she came to me. Um, so we need to know our dog's temperaments to determine what method of training we have. Another trainer uh, messaged me and said, thank you, Hector. All I've been doing is using treats and my success rate was 50-50. And I said, listen, that's very low. You need to go a lot higher. So either select the dogs just for treat methods or refer the dogs that you can't train to another trainer because you don't want, you don't want that reputation that you only can fix 50-50% of the dogs. You don't want that. You'll, you'll gain a lot more integrity. You'll gain a lot more... Um, a lot more uh, uh, just uh, just being honest with them. Very, very important. There's some dogs that I, I, I they're out of my element and, and I would tell them, okay? Maybe I would, I would need to go and refer them to a behaviorist with medication. I have no problem doing that. None at all, okay? Heidi Moen, uh, since I'm going to get puppies again, now, now with Ronan, man, Ronan, 16. I got that dog for you, Heidi. I remember 16 years ago. Dang, that was one tough, that was one tough case. I'm glad we got him out of that abused situation. Even though the guy didn't say he was abused, I know he was abused. Uh, Greg from California, thanks for watching. Greg, I tell you, I can't wait to get over there. I'm, I'm telling you. Uh, but I'm glad you're watching. Alan, thanks for watching. We got some history in our, in our family. Alan's like a brother. 
Alan's like a brother to me. My mom used to cook for him every day. He used to eat more than we do, though. Uh, Rick, thanks for watching. Anyways, so let's get started on this raising the perfect puppy because I can get pretty animated about, about other stuff. Let me make sure everybody's here. Uh, let's see here. Megan, I have two 12-week-old Jack Russell puppies. Megan, I think we, we emailed each other, Megan. I think we're, we're scheduled to, you're, you're in my class, I think. I'm not positive. I had a rush of uh, messages that I'm going through, but this is very good to, to watch, Megan. I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you joined in. So again, raising the perfect puppy. Let's talk about the first slide: setting boundaries. This is in, in, this is important. Why is this important? Listen. How do we convey to our dog that we're not dogs? How do we convey to the puppies that we're not puppies? In their world, they think we are a puppy. Put it. Just put it in their world. In their world, we think we are puppies. How do we convey to them that we're not? Why don't we want to convey that we are? It's very important that they know that we are not puppies because they're going to treat us like puppies, meaning they're going to mouth us, meaning they're going to start doing stuff to us just like they would another dog. So in saying that, it is important that you do not rough play and wrestle with these puppies with your hands. I don't want you rustling with them. I don't want you putting your hands in their mouth. I don't want you to grabbing them and pinning them down. I don't want you playing the chess game with them where you run and they chase you and they run and they chase you because when you get to the come command, you're going to be sorry about that. But for the other one, the rough playing, you're teaching them that you're a dog too. Hands are equivalent to mouths. They do the same thing that mouths do. They grab and they can cause pain. So when we use our hands, we are conveying to the dog that hands are mouths. This is why they will bite your hand thinking you were going to hurt them. So, and usually they go for the wrist or they go for, or your fingers. So it's very important that you don't rough play and play the chase game. Proof your house. Listen, if you got a puppy, please people put the shoes away. Don't leave them out. These dogs, these puppies have no value in your items that you have. They have no value in the furniture that you have. They have no value in your carpet. They have nothing. Puppy proof your house. For about seven to eight months, you're going to get all these shoes off the floor, not teaching the dog bad habits to go after your shoes. You are not going to play tug of war with dirty socks because they smell like shoes. You're not going to play tug of war with clothes because then you're going to chew on your clothes. You see where I'm getting at? So puppy proof your house. I already talked about no hands on, but it's very important. I'm going to sound like a broken record because it merits to be said over and over and over. Don't go hands on. There's, there's, there's very, very rare cases that you would. And I don't even think those merited even me talking about them because they're so rare. But puppy proof your house. Don't, uh, don't rough play with your dog. Don't play the chase game. Uh, puppy proof your house. Remove all the stuff off the floor. Maybe put baby gates in restricted areas. And then no hands on. Okay? I hope that, I hope that makes sense. So uh, let's go to the next slide, which would be imprint training. Now, training puppies how to learn. It is imperative that you use treats. Now, if, if you have to use any kind of boundary setting with the dog biting you or, or chasing you, that's separate. Okay, right now we want to imprint the training and learning. We want to teach the dog when you hear a word, you attach it to a behavior. Whether you get a treat or not, you attach it to a behavior. You hear sit. My butt hits the ground and I get a treat as soon as that happens. Okay? I call it paying the dog. So you pay the dog. You pay him. You pay him for doing what you want him to do. He's, I know it sounds transactional, but it's, it's a, it's, it is basically transactional. You do this for me, I do this for you. You don't want any stress. All right? Very important. Treats are good. Now, if you don't want to use treats like I don't, I use the dog's puppy food. So... I'll feed it in the morning, and the second serving is going to be training, which would be their food. That would be the second serving. So I'm not adding to anything in this digestive system. 
like like bad treats or if I'm having potty training issues, I'm not adding more food. So I'm using a second serving of food for training. You'll see how that works. It works great for the dogs. They expect to be trained in the afternoon. They expect to be trained in the evening. And it's great for them because they're ready for it. They're ready. Groomers and veterinarians, nail clipping. Do not allow anybody to pin your dog down for nail clipping or the alpha roll. That is abusive. That is abusive with any temperament of dog. Doesn't matter if he's dominant, it's abusive because you're not going to get anything from it. All right, so it's very important. No pinning. I, I don't know many, many groomers who do that method anyway. It's, it's usually owners and some veterinarians, but understand veterinarians, they're restricted to time, time sensitive, and they may not have time to work with your dog on nail clipping or manage it. That's our job. That's our job to do that. Don't allow your vet to, to spend that time trying to train the dog. They don't, that's not their scope of job. That's our job. We'll talk about that. Again, no hands-on. Avoid mistakes by management and developing good habits. We're going to talk about that, okay? Flam family needs to be consistent during imprinting, only to make things easier on the dog. When they're young, their brain under stress shuts down. Their brain under stress shuts down and they internalize stress, okay? Now, some may fight when they're 8, 10 weeks old. That Man, can you imagine when they get older? You avoid that. You want to avoid those type of battles of wills when they're puppies. All right? It's very important. Let's see. Chad and Stacy, thanks for watching. You're in my obedience class. I hope things are going good. Heidi, uh, Loki, 20 years ago. Yes, that was a long time ago, Heidi. Uh, Cherish uh, Osborne, thanks for watching. So you people who are just coming on, go back to my replay and uh, watch a uh, couple of beginning slides in my introduction. It, it'll kind of give you some tips. Now, Family needs to be consistent during imprinting. Try your best because, again, right when they get about five or six months old, you don't have to be consistent with some of these smart dogs. But a meek dog and a sensitive dog, they need to be consistent. Remember, a fearful dog needs to be consistent because they're in survival mode. Can you imagine going hands-on on a fearful puppy? Can you imagine what you're doing to its brain? You have any idea what you've just cornered this dog to do. It's, it, don't do it. Very important. This is why you need to know temperaments. All right? Well, okay, that's enough for that one. Let's go into feeding. Now, if you're having potty training issues, and I think, I think it was Ann who had potty training issues, there, this is important. So you could set your dog up to fail by how you feed it. Uh, Mickey Zoe, thanks for watching. My, uh, my niece in uh, California, thank you. Heidi Ball, thanks for watching, and Ashley Kelly, I appreciate that. So, feeding. Add water to food. That helps them digest the food, people. Can you imagine just eating dry kernels, and that's it? Hell, just imagine how they go down your throat if they're dry. Add water. How much water, Hector? Add just enough water like you would on a bowl of cereal. They need, you need to help them digest it. I have a flyer on my on my website that, will, that goes into great detail on how to feed a dog. Very important for, for dogs who are going to be large and, and the torsion. You don't want their stomach to, fix, to flip. So food and water, feed schedule. I, if, if you want a good consistent bowel movement, you schedule the feeding. Okay, I feed twice a day. I have never fed three times a day in my whole 35 years of training dogs. Never fed three times a day. I only feed twice. In the morning or, and in the late afternoon or evening, okay? Now, that allows me to know when my dog's got to go to the bathroom. How do you know I'm overfeeding? If my dog has to go to the bathroom more than two to three times a day, I'm overfeeding. If I'm overfeeding, I'm setting my dog up to fail. There was a, there was a puppy in my puppy class who was defecating five to six times a day. I mean, really? Wow. Wow. Of course you're having issues with him defecating in the house. So two to three times a day, that's how you know you're not overfeeding. I don't normally go by the, by the bag because a lot of the bags will tell you to overfeed. Of course they will. They want you to feed more so you can buy more dog food. Two to three times a day. Required amount, times and food. That's FDA website. The FDA has a website 
that uh, regulates dog food because of all the issues we've been having with dog food. So go to that website. If you're feeding one of those dog foods that are on that website, then be careful. Go to another website that would tell you what good foods. I think it's called Dog Food Advisory. That's another good one to, to look to see what foods are, are recommended. Um, avoid sodium and bad treats. This is why I use dog food for their treats. I use dog food so I don't have to use any treats. If, 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 if very important. And if I do use treats, I like to use like cheese or something that's not gonna, not really gonna hurt them and mess them up. Uh, Cindy, thanks for watching. Uh, Michelle, uh, Michelle Lynn, thanks for watching. So I hope that helps people. So. You don't want to set your dog up to fail and feeding. Again, food and water, schedule feeding versus free feeding. I schedule feed. I do not free feed. It's going to be hard for you to know when he's got to go to the bathroom if you, if you, um, if you free feed. He's going to eat, and then he's got to go. So I'd much rather know. And we're going to, when we talk about potty training, you'll see how this works for you. I hope uh, Barry Farhat, thanks for watching. All right, let's go to the next slide. Potty training. Avoid correction. Now, if I tell you when they're going to go to the bathroom and you fail to catch them, then you need to be corrected, not the puppy. Puppy's brain process is not going through, okay, I have to go to the bathroom, I have to run to the door. They don't have that yet. You need to teach this through habits. So this is how we do it, Ann. You take them out after they eat, after they take a nap, and after they play, just assume they have to go those three times. Now, if they're, if they're small, if they're small, you may have to carry them outside. Big deal. Carry them outside where you want them to go until they're ready to walk. A lot of these people, the, the dog will pee on their way to the door and they get upset. I'm like, your dog is eight weeks old. He can't even make it to the door. You got to carry them till you go out. Take them where you want them to go. Take them where you want them to go. Is raw dog food okay with a puppy, or should you wait till older? Uh, Karis, I don't know. That's an easy thing. I don't know. Um, I know there are some people who feed raw, and there's some good websites. Um, I would entertain the thought of maybe going to do a little bit of searching uh, with that. So I, I can't help you there. Um, Sarah Kent, thanks for watching. Dan, thanks again for watching again. What, what about adding wet dog food? Oh, Megan, yes. But remember, Megan, try not to mix it in and try to balance it with, with the dry dog food so you don't overfeed. But very good. I didn't mention that. Thank you for, for adding that. Now, the good thing I, 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 like, I like some of these questions is because um, after I get done the replay, people watch them. So if I don't have them on there and you got a good question like that, it's added on here. Uh, just like Karis, I'm going to do some research when I get done here and find out. Um, I don't know. So we'll, we'll find out together. So again, carry, carrying them outside until they're able to walk fast. Schedule feeding helps because you know when they got to go, especially if they have to go after they eat, after they play, and after they take a nap. Very important. Crate training works. Crate training. I know a lot of people don't believe in crate training, but let me tell you, I've seen too many dogs who owners do not believe in crate training and then they got to take him to the vet, and the first time they're in a crate is at the vet. You just traumatize your dog. If anything, if you don't believe in crate training, I'm good with that. But at least acclimate your dog to the crate, so if in the event that you do need to crate him, you have that available. And there's not an abandonment or trauma issue there. Very easy. We're going to talk about crate training, okay? I also have a flyer on my website about crate training, okay? Very, very important. Now, eating stools. Hopefully, you don't have a dog, a puppy who eats stools. If you do, I fixed a dog in my puppy class in two days with this. I had him switch to a good dog food, and then I told her to put probiotics in the dog's food. That's it. You want to teach this puppy as a right from the get-go that it can't eat his poop. Dogs don't eat with their, with their taste buds. They eat with their nose. So if it smells good, they're going to eat it. Did you hear me? They eat with their nose. The dog food industry has made the dog food smell really good, even though it's bad for them, almost like candy. Okay, very important. Vince, uh, what do you feed your dogs? I feed Purina, which they're 
from what I understand, they're the only company who regulates themselves. And I also feed from, all right, Joey's Outfitters, um, very, very knowledgeable in dog in dog food. I went there and he, he, he literally spent 10 minutes educating me on the right food. Um, it, it, it helped me a tremendous amount. That's not my field of study. So I give it to somebody who is. So I went to Joey's Outfitters and got that. Um, so eating stools, quality, good food and probiotics. Uh, I talked about crate training. Now, when you take them out, when you take them out, walk them around. Don't just stand there and think they're going to go. They need their, they need their bowels to get moved. They need their body moved. Get them moving. Understand that every single one of these dogs teeth is sharp. They don't, they don't chew their food. They swallow it. So when they swallow it, it's whole. This is why you want to put water in it. So by walking them around, you get them going, you get them moving, you get that, you get that digestive system going. So walk them around. Don't just stay there. Very important. Now, if they do make a mistake in the house, this is important with the little dogs. If they do make a mistake in the house, don't flush the defecation down the toilet. Take the defecation outside where you want them to go and use that as a signpost. It is that simple. Use that as a signpost. If they're going small amounts all over the place, especially urine, if they're going small amounts all over the place, that's indicative of a UTI, a bladder infection. So take them to the vet. So take them to the vet. You know what? I should have mentioned that in the beginning. One of the first things you should do is take your dog to the vet and make sure he doesn't have worms and make sure you start getting him on a good medical routine with a good vet. That's going to prevent you to have potty training issues, prevent you to have many other issues. Can you imagine your dog having worms and then you, you're doing everything else right, but yet you haven't wormed the dog? Of course he's going to have mistakes. So take the defecation outside where you want them to go and use that as a signpost. Now, for urine, I have, I have gotten that buck urine at the, uh, at, at the, sh at the store and just, and just sprayed it all over where I want my dog to go out and back, and my dogs just focus there, and that's where they pee. All right? So that's what I use. It's another animal instead of a person's, another animal sense of urine, and puppies pick up on that really quick. Um, the main issue with, uh, with little dogs is that we overfeed them, and we don't put water in their food, and when we get out there, we don't walk them around. You're gonna have issues in the winter, especially with dogs who have hair similar to ours. Not me, us, okay? Uh, but what happens is, as soon as that wind hits, eh, they get freezing. Can you imagine walking outside and that air hitting you? And what does that do to your inside? Insides, it just tightens you right up. And now you can't go anymore. So you can do the, you can do the uh, potty training inside, you know, just with a box in there. Let them go inside. They make great things that you can buy that you can put inside your apartment and you can clean and drain daily just to make sure that your little dog doesn't develop a UTI or doesn't develop behavior issues. The, um, here's what happens if you discipline your dog, if you catch the dog in the act of potty training. If, 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 they, if they go to the bathroom and you're potty training them, if you catch them in the act, they will learn not to go where you're at. They will go upstairs or downstairs or away from you, under, maybe behind a sofa. So catching them in the act does not work if you discipline. You catch them in the act, very calmly pick them up, take them outside where you want them to go. Even better than that, before you catch them in the act, take them outside where you want them to go. All right? So disciplining allows them to hide from you so they don't get disciplined. You haven't really made a connection not to go in the house, just to not go in front of you, all right? Remember, you're creating a habit. You're creating a habit. Uh, Sensa Marvo, I, nice to see you there. Uh, hope all is well, amigo. Hey, listen, I love your marriage pictures. Very, very nice. I met you in Colorado at an animal control uh, presentation I did. Uh, oh my God, it, it had to be 10 years ago, I think. But it was, it's nice to see you. Uh, thanks for watching. Samantha, thanks for watching. David Craig, thank you. Heather, thanks for watching. So very, very important, you guys, potty training. If you have any issues and I didn't go over something, please go back to my replay and or go to my homepage, 
on my website and go to my dog training flyers. It has a flyer on how to do it step by step. Um, my last thing is uh, bells or problem solving. Um, both of those, uh, the, the, the leash, I usually have the puppy tied to my waist because listen, I may not be able to watch my puppy all the time, but this is what I do to prevent any issues with potty training. I, I feed my dog, I take him out, I walk him around, he goes to the bathroom, he comes back in. Um, and then I, I just spend some time with him. If I can't spend any more time with him, he goes in the crate. And then if I feel guilty, I make sure to dedicate some time to play with him until he gets really tired. And then he goes back in the crate so he can sleep. It's literally that simple. All right. I do that a lot. I mean, I'm talking five, eight times a day. But you know what? That's that, you're, it's a puppy. That's a puppy. You're molding it. All right. The next one. Hopefully I don't have any. Hopefully I didn't leave any questions out. The bells one. Um, there's there's a I haven't wrote a flyer on that yet, but just to, just so I can make this because there's so much information here on puppies that understand that when I when I start doing these shows, I'm also re-editing my first book. It's 90% done. It's going to go over many, many things. It's going to be it's called the art of dog obedience. Um, it's going to go over many, many, many things. So just um, if, if I forget and it's not written on there, well, I hope you can buy my book then. So anyways, let's go into the sixth slide, which is bonding, which is bonding. All right. Uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. Bonding in order of importance. This is going to be quick. Play. Play is number one for puppies. Not with your hands. Play with a flirt pole. Very important, or if your dog's already, your puppy's already retrieving, play, play, play. Tug of war, yes, 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 tug of war is good. Teach the puppy to target an object, even a toy, instead of your hands. Remember, your puppy's brain thinks it can bite you because it thinks you're a puppy. So this is why it's important to give it something to tug of war with. Channel it right from a puppy. You can bite this all day long. You can bite this knuckle bone. You can bite this rawhide until it gets too small, then I have to throw it away. You can bite this tug. Teach it to bite an object. Very important. That is number one. This is how you bond with the dog. Now, if you think not, then wait till we talk about how to, how to bond with a loyal dog. You, if you get a loyal dog, the only way to bond with them is through play. Just through play. That's gonna bond with them. Food is guaranteed. He might even guard his food. But bonding, play. Time, exposure is second. Feeding is third. And contact is fourth. This is why I like to groom my own dogs. Because it, it bonds with the dog. It creates, it creates a bond like nurturing. Because you're brushing, you're brushing, you're nurturing the dog. So it, it, it's nice to bond with the dog. Sean, thanks for watching. And Mako, thank you. Um, so I hope that helps. But number of importance, play is number one. Play is number one. Raising a sound puppy. Now, exposure, people. Exposure supersedes socialization. When I got my dog, Malo, I think less than five people touched him before he was a year old. Before, before he was a year old, he saw hundreds of dogs and only played with one. And that was limited. And there's nothing wrong with him. That is the same attribute you want from a service dog. You want a service dog to walk up and see a hundred people and not jump on them and not want to be petted and just remain calm. No different than when my dog sees 100 dogs. He sees them, no big deal. Exposure supersedes socialization. The only exception to the rule is if your dog is shy. If your dog is shy, he does need to be touched. But this is why it's important to know the difference between shy and fearful. If your dog is fearful, he doesn't need to be touched. He needs to be exposed more than anything. Not socialized through touching, he needs to be exposed because if you go to reach on a fearful dog, he tightens up his body and you touch him, you just rewarded him for being afraid. A shy dog will, will need that confidence. That's the only dog that I would say. To, and then it might, it might get to the point where he's fine now, then you have to ease up a little bit, all right? Socializing, very, very important. Many issues of jumping, many issues of, of 
a hyperness have to do with over socializing your dog exercising when to do impact training as a puppy my dogs are playing all day long at ground level I don't let them jump and hit the ground I don't want their growth plates to be to be uh, hurt so what they're doing is I'm they're walking straight a lot of people say you shouldn't be exercising your puppy for very long I said I guarantee you put a Fitbit on my puppy he's gone 15 miles in my house I guarantee these dogs can't stop running around so as long as you don't do a lot of impact uh, training to be best uh, Vince you're the best Hector thank you Vince I appreciate that yes Vince uh, I did a talk for you on uh, how to deal with difficult people and dog encounters for the uh, Lansing code enforcement I do remember that I always got a good crowd there always got a good crowd and I was scheduled uh, to go up to Traverse City this uh, this year but it was canceled maybe next year uh, Kara thanks for watching so I hope that helps raising a sound puppy a mentally sound puppy calming dog and your emotions now what happens is if you see your own dog get excited try to manage your own emotions so you don't set them up to fail remember when they're hyper when they're hyper and excited their neck and shoulders are full of blood they don't feel pain they don't even hear anything they just get excited so it's very important to remain calm and and just look at your dog's body language I, what I like to do, if my dog gets excited when he sees me, I introduce myself with a toy. I introduce myself with a toy and I play with the dog. So I channel that excitement onto an object. I channel that excitement onto an object. All right, let me, uh, I'm gonna make sure I didn't miss any questions here. Uh, Aaron, thanks for watching, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Nope, it looks like we're going good. Looks like we're going good. Rick, I appreciate watching, Rick. It looks like you have a uh, Central Asian Shepherd on your profile picture. Either that or a St. Bernard. I can't tell. Um, I, I, uh, my, it's really small um, where I'm looking at. So I, it's hard for me to tell. So again, raising a sound puppy. I don't have any questions on that. Um, if you do, Danielle, thanks for watching. Danielle, oh boy, did we have a heck of a one-on-one, -on -one, didn't we, with your dog. We transferred that dog from aggression to submission to a nice, nice level-headed dog. I'm so glad you brought him. Uh, submissive urination. Um, good, good question, Heidi. It could be for several reasons. It could be because the dog's already submissive through temperament. And if that's the case, then you, you want to remain neutral when you, come, when you walk up to the dog. If it's not through the temperament, if it's due to maybe harsh verbal correction or hands-on, some dogs, once you start potty training and somebody's gone hands-on with them, Heidi, now the dog starts to get submissive because it's anticipating a correction. It doesn't know why it got corrected. It just thinks that it's going to get corrected. So it's important to not go hands-on to avoid that. The, the temperament, uh, the submissive urination, there's, there's a couple things to it. One, remain neutral, manage your emotions. And two, you might have to wait for the dog to get old enough to control the bladder. So what I do with submissive urination, if the dog comes to me, I automatically take him out and play with him. So that energy goes onto an object and he doesn't learn to get excited with me. It learns to get excited towards an object, which means I can manage that. So the only, dog, the only time the dog gets excited is with an object. All right, very, very good question. Uh, Danielle also is doing great after a one-on-one. -on -one. It's like having a totally different dog. I told you you're going to have a new dog. I told you, but I'm glad you trusted me, uh, Danielle. Thank you for that. Uh, the other Danielle, Danielle Bas Basco, our lab is head shy. According to our vet, does it require more socialization? If it's head shy, uh, send me a video. So what happens with dogs that are head shy, make sure that nobody's taught him that hands are bad. So if you go to reach for him, Danielle, and he, sh and he shies down, be careful, he, nobody's corrected him. If nobody's corrected them, then what I want you to do is instead of overreaching him, I want you to underreach him. So pet him under his chin so he, so he starts to learn that the hand's not coming over him. He could, be, he could be shy and over, it's very intimidating, have someone over, over him. So pet under his chin and just, just kind of like massage his chin a little bit, relax him a little bit. Then as he sees you, he's going to think that you're not going to go over, so he lifts his head up. It could be those two things, okay? I hope that helps. Um, over, 
be careful over socializing. Look, look at the body language to determine if it needs to be social, uh, uh, socialized or not. And then go back to my replay if you want to know um, <coughs> how to differentiate between a, a shy dog and a fearful dog. Okay, very important to know. Uh, Jessica, my six-month-old puppy gets excited and jumps on me. Jessica, go back to my website. I have two flyers on preventing your dog from jumping and stopping your dog from jumping. That's going to help a lot. That's, that's a very, it's a loaded question, a lot to unpack there. But go back to those flyers. They help you a lot. I was going to add those flyers to my comments. I just ran out of time. Um, Gail Carpenter, thanks for watching. Uh, let's see here. Ann Mako, why avoid dog parks? Um, good question, Ann. I like to avoid dog parks because I don't know whose dog's out there. I, again, Ann, I live in a different world. All I see is bad things. In other words, all people call me about is bad things. Uh, the last, uh, there was a civil case I was just in where the lady went to the dog park and her dog attacked her dog. And because it's a property crime, she had to, she was getting sued. So in other words, it's just hard to get out there. Um, if you can trust those dogs and you can read body language and their dogs are fine, then it's okay. I, I just don't happen to be in that arena to, to really promote them. Um, Meridian Township has, has parks where they split the dogs in different sizes. Those are really good, and, um, but there are not many out there like that. But I like to avoid dog parks for that reason. People take them to over-socialize with their dogs and, and, and again, that you're teaching them, here's what happens when you over-socialize the dog, and you teach the dog that running, that running with the dogs and exercising and playing, that's how you relieve stress. You don't want to teach a dog that. We domesticated him to pull him out of that, okay? When we start doing that, as the dog gets older, he starts to think that, and then that turns into even more issues. You want the dog to learn to relieve his stress with an object the way his instinct surfaces, not through other dogs and playing. You can take him to dog parks, just don't take him too many times. I just stay in the side of air because of all the lawsuits that I get called on, the civil cases because of the dog parks, okay? I hope that helped, uh, and uh, Jessica, how much water should I a puppy have? Um, when you're feeding, Jessica, just put just enough water like you would a bowl of cereal. And then monitor how much water they get throughout the day, depending on their exercise or depending on the temperature. And then on my website, on, there's a flyer on how to check if your dog's dehydrated or not. Okay, that will help. That helps me a lot. If your dog's having potty training issue, I want to restrict the water. If your dog's not having potty training issues, then give him all the water he wants. But it's just during that little learning curve you don't want to fill their bladder up, and then they have to go all the time. You want to control the water intake at that time. Uh, German Shepherd is starting to play with our water dish. Yeah, I will control the water. So just leave it out. Don't leave it out. Just have it down. If it doesn't drink, then just put it away. He's bored. So you might want to play with him in another way that appeases his instinct, uh, Megan. Uh, Jessica, excuse me. Uh, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. You came to me with your first dog. I'm sad to hear. I was sad to hear and read about, your, uh, about the dog that you and I trained. Um, so I, I know you got a puppy now, which is great. Here, let me read what you say. My puppy's three months, and we walk twice a day for about 10 minutes. Can we go for longer walks? Um, I, as, for puppies, I go till they're tired. They're, if you're going straight, you're, you shouldn't have to worry. That's a good way to exercise a puppy, especially because his instincts haven't surfaced. Okay, how long? Um, temperature is one thing. So look, just look at the dog. I mean, I had a puppy that, that went a mile, and I came home, and he was tired for the next four hours. I had a puppy who went maybe four or five blocks and wanted to come back. So it varies from puppy to puppy, but that's a damn good question. Um, so make sure longer walks. I tell you, Sarah, you put a Fitbit on some of these puppies in the house, they've gone maybe 10, 15 miles sometimes running back and forth all over the place. So don't be, don't be afraid to go too far. You, just no impact, no, well, they land really hard. Uh, Sanessa, I wish I could do a one-on-one -on -one with you. I have a dog humper. Ah, Sanessa, humping is a destructive way to handle stress. So what I want you to do is go back to my replay on how to, how to decompress a dog physically and mentally. Most likely you have to massage the dog's side um, to release some tension and on their back, 
and also play with them in a way that complements their instincts so they stop pumping. This may not be a one-on-one -on -one issue. This just may be a way to um, avoid that destructive behavior. It has nothing to do or it has very little to do with procreation. Hey, Jill, thanks for watching. Casey, I have, uh, I've got a humper, I've got a humper too. <laughs> hey, listen, go, J same thing applies, Casey. Really, if he's a puppy, he, he's, he's, he's getting too excited. And so all that blood's going to his, his shoulders and neck, and he's got a hump to relieve that stress. The next thing's going to be digging. So you've got to control that dog's excitement. Find his triggers and get him to play and get him to play. If he's a really little puppy, then the most likely is we're triggering him. It could be our mere presence could be triggering him. If it's our mere presence, then give him an object when he sees you. Okay, very, very important. Uh, I, I, you're right, uh, uh, Heidi. A tired puppy is a good puppy. However, however, be careful. We have to tire him out the right way so we set the imprinting for when they get older. Many people, Ann, I'll go back to Ann's questions about dog parks. Many people take their dog to the dog park so they play and play and play. Then when they reach maturity, the dog has no outlet for its instinct. All he wants to do is play with other dogs. The problem is, is that this dog doesn't know boundaries now. And now if the dog handles stress with aggression, now this dog wants to fight, not play. So we have to be careful with that. How we, how we get them tired is is going to be more important than than just getting them tired. So this morning again, I went out there with my puppy Amigo, played frisbee and frisbee and frisbee, four frisbees going back and forth. That got him tired. If I would run him, he'd come back in, want me to play with him more because that doesn't appease his instinct. Uh, Rochelle, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pro uh, properly exposing my eight month. Uh, Michelle, uh, Rochelle, wait until we go to a one on one. Um, I know your dog was experiencing fearful, fearful moments. So let's wait and try to ascertain what we need to do to, to get a good plan of action. Okay. How do we calm him down when we're at a good distance without reinforcing? Uh, you don't want to use negative reinforcement um, when, you, when you're doing stuff like that, exposing him. You, you want to make sure that he's calm and relaxed because negative reinforcement, well, what, what that will do is that will trigger his, his fear. You don't want to do that because then he won't recall what he what you're trying to teach him. So you want him relaxed when you start exposing him. I hope that I hope that makes sense. Uh, hi Hector, we're watching and guess who is sleeping? Ah, your tough little puppy. We found out he was tougher than what we thought. All right, let me go. I got four more slides, you guys. Uh, and again, I'm gonna go over again, but it's okay. It is okay. Genetics. There are certain there are certain things that are gonna happen. They are breed specific. They're just going to happen because of the breed. There's valid expectations based on your dog's breed that are going to surface. Don't say that I wish my dog wasn't ag aggressive when you got a German Shepherd. Don't say that I wish, I wish my dog didn't want to play all the time if you got a lab. Come on, people. Those dogs want to play. They want to release their instinct. So certain things are going to evolve based on the breed. Just like us, right? Certain things. However, with dogs, they ma males mature at eight to 10 months, females six to eight. As a general rule, there are dogs who mature a little younger and a little older. But as a general rule, that's when it happens. This is why you want to do obedience, not training, before their instincts surface. And this is why you want to appease their instincts when they're young. So you have something to fall back on. Instead of taking them to dog parks, you appease their instincts, all right? Valid basic expectations. So each, each breed, like we talked about in my two shows ago, breed have valid expectations. So expect them to happen. This is why you need to know the dog that you have. Temperament testing. If I'm going to have kids, I want my dog to have a high pain tolerance. If, I'm, if my friends are going to have kids over, I want my dog to have a high pain tolerance. I don't want my dog to have a low pain tolerance if a kid grabs him and then my dog bites him. So this is, and a lot, when I do temperament testing, people get a little disappointed. Why are you hurting my dog? Listen, I want to be bitten. I want to be bitten, not, not the neighbor's kid that can sue you, not your own kid that you need to protect. Because if you allow your dog to bite your own kid, that's domestic violence. Yes, it's a puppy now, but he learns through imprinting that it's okay. 
So it's very important to have valid expectations. And with temperament testing, you want to find out how your dog is going to handle pain. You don't need to hurt them really bad. You just need to hurt them enough to get a response. They don't need to yipe out of pain. You don't need to do that. Just when their mouth closes and then they try to mouth you a little bit, you know if you reach their threshold. That's it. One of the things that I that I, I had a call in animal control on was a lady called me and she said, Hector, would you come look at this dog with me? I'm like, why do I need to come with you? Well, I called animal control and they told me that they didn't know if this dog was good around kids or not. I said, well, what did they ask? What did they say? They said to bring my kid to find out. What the hell is wrong with you? No, don't bring your kid. You bring your kid to find out and your dog gets bit. That's animal. That's that's what? That's child endangerment. They should know how to test dogs if they're going to be good around kids. If they don't, they need to do something else. Or if they don't, they need to say, I don't know. It is that simple. I don't know. And then have a trainer go there and help them. Or if a behaviorist doesn't know if they're going to be good around kids, then find one who does. Very important for the safety of your kids. All right? Not all puppies want to be alpha. This is very important. Genetics. Oh, not all dogs want to be alpha people. Do you think a meek dog wants to run the show? He's meek. Do you think a shy dog wants to run the show? No. Do you think a fearful dog wants to run the show? No. Some, some dogs' temperaments do not want to be alpha. A strong-willed dog will. A dominant dog will. A dangerous dog will. But you have your meek, your shy, your fearful, and your companion dogs who don't want to be alpha. Not all dogs want to be there. This is why I like to pick the companion. This is why some people like shy dogs and meek dogs. They don't have to deal with that battle of wills. But you deal with a strong will dog, you're going to. See, this is why you need to know temperament. This is why you need to know temperament. Very important. Uh, let's see here. I know I'm getting my almost seven month old Rottweiler into you for training as soon as I'm able. Uh, if he's seven months, um, if he's coming soon, Megan, just keep him on a harness. Uh, don't put a pinch collar on him. This is a, if you have a Rottweiler, his brain tells him with a pinch collar, his brain tells him to challenge you, okay? So, so he's predisposed to handle stress with aggression. So just stick to the harness until you see me, okay? Stick to the harness till you see me. Uh, let's see here. My puppies are constantly wrestling and playing. Ah, Megan uh, Preco Smith, go back to my website and look on how to raise two dogs at the same time. You are going to make, you're going to cause one huge vital error with two dogs playing, okay? They're, they're, there's actually a syndrome for that. What is it? Uh, sibling syndrome. All they want to do is play. When they get older, they're, all they're going to want to do is fight. To avoid that, you've got to separate them both and play with them both so they, they're both of them get appeased with their same instinct, okay? You might even have to do one at a time, but don't let them play together. Now, if you can't control them, one's on the lead and one's playing, and then switch them over, and then the flyer will give you more tips. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's not on my uh, that's not on my my show today. So thank you. Um, they, they go back right to each steal each other's toy chew bones. Even if I would just prevent the playing, the chew bones are good. Um, if if two puppies living together start fighting, I put one in the crate with a bone and leave one out with a with a bone. All right, Patty, thanks for watching. I love your T-shirt. Thank you, Patty. I knew you were gonna say something, Patty. I love you, girl. I appreciate you. Uh, Karen, thanks for watching. Janice. Uh, Charlie Williams, my friend's eight mold uh, Jack Russell Terrier mixed snaps at my six year old. Okay, um, Charlie, what happens is that some dogs don't know their boundaries with other dogs. Some dogs have a personal space. A, a lot of dogs who have been traumatized by another dog don't trust other dogs, just like they won't trust hands. So those dogs are not forgiving. So if a dog gets attacked by another dog, he's going to learn through survivor mode that he wants his personal space. So then if another dog walks up to him and this dog doesn't respect his personal space, that dog will snap at him to teach him personal space. Now, we often think that the dog who bit has the problem. No, that's the dog who wants his personal space. The one who has a po the problem is the one who doesn't know boundaries. So your, your worst enemy is going to be a dog who doesn't know boundaries, Charlie. I hope that makes sense. Uh, Cash does not want to run the show. You're right. He, he doesn't. 
not all dogs want to be alpha. Just not like all people want to be alpha. All right. Uh, I, uh, let's see. I have a 10-month-old uh, male terrier. Yes, he need. Okay, Michelle, he needs a game to play. Get a nice little. What, I'm gonna see male terrier mix. Uh, tug of war, tug of war, and give him a ball, a uh, rubber ball that he can bite constantly. When he's done, put it away. Don't let him. Don't let him. Don't have a bunch of toys in the house with him. He's, he needs an off switch from that. All right, he needs an off switch from those. I hope that helps, Michelle. He wants something constantly in his mouth because that's what his breed tells him to do. Play, play tug of war, get get his oral fixation fixed, make sure, and then give him an off switch or he's going to create an OCD with biting. You don't want that. You don't want that. Uh, Jennifer, uh, hi, Hector. People's four months old husky growls and nips at me when I try to put her in a crate at night. Uh, Pebbles. Oh, Jennifer. Pebbles doing that. Put her on a, a nylon slip lead and just pull her in there. All right? Don't use your hands. Use a leash. To pull her in there all right very important if you're still having an issue there's nothing wrong with using a treat throwing a treat in there put her food in there just throw a treat make it a game you don't want to use force and where a dog feels he's gonna be abandoned in there so nothing wrong with using treats to get it in there what is the temperament uh, of an Australian Shepherd uh, Ellen it depends Ellen I'm gonna I'm gonna infer that most Australian Shepherds have a strong will and have ADD, but that, that that's not that that's not true though. There there I've seen Australian Shepherds that are very meek. So there's eight temperaments that I spoke about in my last week's show, Ellen. When I see your dog in puppy class in December, I'll ascertain which temperament it is, and then we can go from there. All right, your dog before your Australian was strong willed. Always thinking one step ahead of you. Don't think I haven't forgotten your, your golden retriever, how, it, how tough it was with a very high pain tolerance. I remember her. So it depends. The breed can give you what's expected, but I don't know what the temperament is until we see it. Uh, and same with you, Janet. Uh, it just depends on the, on the, on the breed. But I, I've seen G German Shepherds shy. I've seen them fearful. I've seen them companion. I've seen them strong-willed. I've seen them dominant. I've seen them dangerous. So it just depends. Temperament is different than breed. Separate the two. Breed is what you have in a valid expectation based how it's how it's what's expected of it and how it looks and what its job is, its purpose in life. Then you have temperament, which is its personality from it. Ivy's in your sub. Uh, Oh, Janet, Ivy was a companion by the time we got done. Ivy was a companion. She was strong-willed at first. I do remember that. Uh, Brandon, thanks for watching. Uh, let's see here. Make sure I didn't forget anybody. All right, let's go to my next slide. My next slide is about leash training. When they're puppies, I don't like to put anything around their neck. Their trachea sticks out, and their puppy, their brain, their brain tells them, that anything around their neck could be a what? It could be death. So they go in distress. You're killing them. They panic. They shut down. They hit the ground. They're scared. I don't put anything around their neck. If you get a strong willed puppy or a dominant puppy, you're going to get them fighting, grabbing the bite and the leash, biting, biting and trying to get it out. Start with a harness and just have a, uh, a collar around their neck, but start with a harness first. Teach them to pull, that it's okay to pull. And then when they get a little older, like 12, 14 weeks, then put some neck pressure on their neck. So what you do there is you put the leash around their neck, you have someone in front of you with a treat or with their food, and have them pull you to the food. Have them pull you to something. But avoid any neck pressure when they're 8, 10 weeks, 12 weeks old. Avoid neck pressure. Their brain tells them that you're going to hurt them. It just does that. So it's very important. Retractables. I'm probably the only trainer who likes retractables. I do. I, I, I like retractables because it allows me to have a lot of movement with the dog in different areas. The only time I don't use a retractable with a puppy is if, if the puppy's impulsive. In other words, it's all over the place. It's just, it just can't settle. Then I'll just use a regular six-foot lead. But if this puppy is really slow and just kind of just likes to convey the area, then there's no reason why I can't, I can't use a retractable lead. Uh, how do you teach your dog boundaries with other dogs? 
Well, when they're young, Danielle, you, you manage it. You don't set them up to fail. You don't do that yet. You wait until they're older to do that. Uh, you have to protect them when they're young because they don't know boundaries. They're very vulnerable. They're very vulnerable to the world. Um, if you can get a dog, what happens, Danielle, is if you take the dog away from the mother too early, the mother is the one who teaches boundaries. And one of the ways they do that, Danielle, is when they stop uh, nursing, their mom would teach them that's enough. And she uses her mouth. We're not going to use our mouth or our hands. So, so they learn boundaries with their mom. The problem that sometimes is that the breeder may not keep the mom there long enough or they may not learn it. So in the event that happens, then we make sure that when we expose them to male dogs or uh, excuse me, any dog, that we don't set them up to fail and we don't, we don't hurt them uh, by causing them an injury from another dog. So we manage them, keep them on a leash and don't let them get too close to a dog that we don't know. Our all sees alpha. They can be, they can be, and I'll, I'll, I'll qualify that, Ellen. They can be because they're predisposed to go after a 2,000 pound animal. They're predisposed to handle stress with aggression. All right, so remember that. Uh, what is the temperament of a German Shepherd? Uh, Janet, they come in variety of temperaments, variety of personalities. Temperaments is personalities, all right? I hope that helps. Temperament is personalities. All right, so let me see, uh, retractable leashes, uh, acclimating your dog, uh, using motivation. This is when I use treats. I'll, I'll let the dog pull, 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 pull with the harness or the collar. However, listen, this is very important. If you have a shy, fearful, meek, fearful dog, please take the harness off right around five to six months because there is no way that this dog is gonna gain confidence with a harness because it allows them to, to retreat. So it sees something and it retreats. They're gonna learn to retreat to avoid stress. You don't want that. You don't want that with a shy or fearful dog. All right, so this is the biggest mistake I see with people when they bring me a dog, they keep them on a harness after the age of five or six months and some of those dogs are stuck in a fear stage or are shy of different things. And that's because they haven't learned to conquer their fears. What I mean by that is now I had a martingale goes on them or a, a, a collar goes on, a flat collar and martingale. This allows them to just go straight through whatever they're afraid of. I hope that makes sense. This is why you shift over. You don't keep them on a harness. I'll, I'll, I'll qualify that too. A harness, if you allow them to pull, pull, pull all the time, they accumulate stress around their neck and shoulders and their back end. Some people say, but I'm holding them back, they're not pulling. Yes, but what's happening is that the harness is putting pressure on their, on their chest, and that pressure restricts them. So they, they use a lot of self-control, but what it's doing, it's also creating tension. Your goal then is gonna be with a, with a collar or off lead, or off lead, or off lead. Uh, Jessica, my puppy will will follow the commands, leave it when treats are involved, but ignores me when the other time. Okay, Jessica, so that means your dog is ready to, to go into obedience. Okay, so the, the, the treat makes it mechanical. The, um, the obedience makes it functional. So you're, you're ready for that. You gotta, you're going to have a strong-willed puppy. He already l learned to train you, Jessica, all right? Uh, but ignores me at other times when I use the table surfing. Uh, puppy biting, chewing. So you have to do a lot of management. We're going to talk about chewing here in a minute. We're going to talk about chewing here in a minute. No, the, the treat's only going to teach them. All the, all the treats are going to do is, is teach them the sit and the stay. It's not going to teach them boundaries. I, I just had a discussion on the phone with, a, with the behaviors about teaching boundaries. She says, if, if a dog needs to be corrected, be, to teach them boundaries, it needs to be on medication. I said, dogs are not moral creatures. How do you teach morals on, with positive reinforcement? You can't. There's no way. That's the second behaviorist this week. And I don't, I don't mind them challenging me. I'm, that's what I'm here for. All right? You have to teach boundaries. Coming to see you the 26th because my dog hates my husband. Well, Ann, we're going to make him love your husband. But in the interim, get, try to get your husband to play with him with a toy. With a toy. Not touch him. Play with a toy. The second thing, if he doesn't want to play, have him take him for walks. 
Those are the two things right now. Uh, could have been abused puppy by a male. He could be by hands. Dogs no learn real quick. Only men correct them with hands. I don't trust men. And they won't. And why would they? They're in survival mode. They should. Uh, Sandy, Hector, this is Colleen Hurst. How you doing, Colleen? I uh, uh, thank you for Mosley on your page. Ah, uh, Colleen. Colleen's first dog, uh, Ziggy, I think it was. Very good, obedient dog. Her other dog, uh, her other dog bit me and is now literally, uh, he, we made a video and this dog has probably saved, I can't tell you how many thousand people from getting bit because I use a video as a training tool. So uh, thank you. Thank you for watching there, Colleen. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see what we got here. Lindsay, thanks for watching. Lindsay Hansen. All right, let me uh, go back. I just got a text and saying that I missed a question and I don't want to miss one. If I do, uh, I'm getting them so fast. There's nothing wrong with repeating them again, people, if, uh, if you missed it, if I missed one. Uh, let's see. Debbie Gamazo, thanks for watching. You're my, you're my, uh, uh, oh my gosh, I'm running a blank. Debbie, uh, Holy Cross Elementary School. Elementary school friend, uh, thank you for watching. All right, uh, I think that's. Uh, I, I don't think I missed. It. I don't think I missed any. At least I hope I didn't. Uh, all right, let me go back. So that's leash training. Let's let's do this now. Let me go. I got two more slides. Common problems. Goal is to not. It's to not prevent. Your goal is to stop. Your goal is to stop, not prevent. So. You can prevent a dog from biting your shoes if you leave them out. You can stop them by pulling them away. Does that make sense? You can prevent your dog from jumping on the counter by leaving food on the counter and by restricting them from jumping up, or you can stop it by not leaving food on the counter. All right? You can prevent the jumping if you get them excited and then stop them, or you can stop the jumping by not getting them excited. Go to my website for that, biting. Very, very important. I'm going to give you the most common mistake people make with biting. And, but go to my website if you have any other issues. Let's talk about biting. Uh, Ray, thanks for watching. Ray Posey, I hope you're out of the hospital, Ray. I seen you were in the hospital. I hope you're better. Um, I hope you weren't faking it so you can get attention. <laughs> I'm kidding, Ray. Uh, I'm going to be watching your show here, too. Uh, I think it's on at 3 or 4 if you're out of the hospital. Anyways, uh, thanks for watching, Ray. Now, biting. Uh, wait a minute, let's go back to teething. Let's go back to teething. Bones, toys, and frozen food concept. For teething, I make sure that my dogs always have like a nyla bone, a knuckle bone, uh, and there's some other bones. When I went to Joey's Outfitters, heck, they had other bones and I had never even heard of. Uh, if you go there, they'll tell you. Um, uh, raw hides are good up until they're small, then I throw them away. But I, I, and if my puppy is going through a really bad teething problem, I freeze the food the night before, both days, and then I give them a frozen block of ice. What that does is that numbs their teeth, that loosens their teeth, and that allows them to eat. Because remember, like I told you, 42 teeth, their dogs do not, they don't, they don't uh, chew their food, they swallow it. By freezing it, you help them chew it to help them loosen up all those teeth and you numb, you numb their gum, so now they don't feel that anxiety to want to bite everything. It helps. Now, the only caveat to that is that it can get messy. It can get messy, but to me, it's worth it. To me, it's worth it because I just just wash them off really bit, uh, uh, quite a bit, and the teething part can be a huge issue. Now, the jumping, I talked about it a little bit already. Um, the biggest issue is over-socializing and getting them excited. Manage your emotions. Some of these dogs are really cute and everybody wants to touch them. And then your dog's going to learn that he's going to jump on everybody. Uh, biting. The biggest mistake people make, please pay attention to this. The biggest mistake people make is when a dog bites you, they give him a toy. What you're doing there is you're, you're rewarding the dog for biting you if you give them a toy after they bite you. You want to give them a toy before they bite you and then be ready with water and vinegar if they bite you by spraying it in their mouth, not their eyes, their mouth, okay? So it's very important to make sure you give them an object before they bite you 
or after you spray them with the water and vinegar, then give them the toy. Do not give them the toy after they bite you to redirect them. Dogs think, if I bite them, I get a toy. So now you're rewarding the behavior you're trying to extinguish. Don't do that. And for more tips, go back to my flyer. Very, very important. Uh, fear stages. Uh, five to seven months. Some dogs go through a fear stage. So it's very important not to have the harness on like we spoke about. This is how I break the fear stage. I get many dogs with fear stage. I put them through stress. Now, what kind of stress? I put them through the obstacle course. You're jumping this A-frame. You're going over this catwalk. You're going through this ladder. And that just snaps them out of it. They're, they get stressed and they snap them out of it. And they're like, wow, I can conquer this. Yes, you can. Let's do this. That's how I snap a dog out of the fear stage. How do I know the difference? A lot of the times the owners would tell me, Hector, he was fine for the first four or five months and then he just got afraid of everything. Ah, he's in a fear stage. Let's snap him out of it. I do it right in front of the owners. It's not like I take him behind the, behind the, the, the dumpster and do something and bring him back. No, I do it in front of the owners so they learn something. So they learn. Uh, let's see, Angela, when should you go from feeding three to two times per day? Uh, Angela, I don't feed three times a day. I feed twice a day. I've never fed three times a day. Here's why. In my experience, if I feed them three times a day, they go through these zoomies three times a day. They just zoom. They're just full of sugar and they just get crazy. So what I do is I feed them twice a day. And then what I, and this is another thing that I've, that I've done for the, my whole time I've trained. I've never fed puppy food. I've always felt adult dog food. Especially, especially if I'm going to have a large breed dog, Great Dane, St. Bernard, uh, Neapolitan Mastiff, Russian Shepherd. I don't feed a puppy food because it allows them to grow too fast. And the chance of them getting pano with that growing disease is really, is higher. So what I do is I just, I slow it down. I slow it down with adult dog food so they slow. And there's not many carbohydrates in the food, uh, in the adult dog food. So the dogs don't go through a, the zoomies as much. But... Uh, that's what I do. I just feed twice a day, uh, Angela. Uh, that's been my experience, and it's worked well for me. I've never fed three times a day. Uh, when is it common for teething age? And they should stop teething. Very good question. They should stop teething before eight months. If they're still mouthing and teething after that, make sure that all their teeth are in. They could have an impact tooth, or they could learn to chew destructively. So very important. Uh, a good vet will know that and take the initiative to look in the dog's mouth to find that out. Okay, a good vet will take the initiative way ahead of you. You know what? A good vet, I've seen vets, very good vets. They'll do stuff and you don't know why they're doing it because that's their job. Their job is to foresee a problem. You don't need to tell them that a problem exists. They need to foresee it. So you'll, you'll get, you'll just, just trust them. They're, they know what they're doing. Most of the time. <laughs> hey, Marge, thanks for watching, Marge. Uh, I'm watching you on my lunch hour. I appreciate that, Marge. I appreciate that. All right, I have one more slide. One more slide, then I got some questions here. Instincts. Instincts surface between six to eight months for females, eight to 10 for males. As a general rule, I've seen border collies, I've seen border collies, their instincts surface at four months. It's, it's crazy. They're, I've seen Shepherd's instinct surface at four months. Okay, I've seen Jack Russell's instinct surface, meaning that they know their purpose in life already. So in other words, they know to chase something obsessively and bite it. But what do you do about it? You appease their instincts. You want to appease their instincts before their instincts surface so you have something to fall back on. Can you imagine not playing with a ball with your dog until he gets eight months? Can you imagine taking to the dog park for the first eight months of their life, if it's a male, and not appeasing their instinct? What are you going to do when they reach maturity? Uh-oh. What's their purpose in life? Every dog has one. For that matter, every person has one, right? If you don't have a purpose in life, if you don't have a purpose in life, then your own sole purpose is to love and be kind, if anything. That could be your sole purpose in life. Be kind and love people. That's it. So anyways, for a dog, it's instinctual. 
It's what they're bred to do. It's what they're designed to do. All right, very important. My dog gets zoomies every time he poops. <laughs> well, make sure that he's not constipated, Megan. <laughs> he might just be getting excited. Oh, that's funny. I like that. Hey, Tori, thanks for watching. I'm glad you're back. So, females, six to eight months. Males, eight to ten. Um, I want to stop and do obedience before instinct surfaces. I want submission before instinct surfaces. I want something to fall back on. I want... If my dog has a propensity to handle stress with aggression and, and, and think I'm weak and has a duty to protect me, I want to make sure that before instincts surface, he's submissive, all right? He's, I mean, he, I follow through with obedience. I tell him to sit, I make him do it without a treat, without a treat. A lot of times, the treat doesn't answer the moral question. The treat doesn't answer the holding you at a higher standard as far as respect. And that's what's merited with some of these dogs who handle stress with aggression. And all I see, all I see nationwide is treats, and then they get older, shot collar. Come on, really? That doesn't make them submissive. And they don't even, they, and they, and they don't even decompress them after that. All right? Method of training to use, that's going to depend on the dog that you have, meaning their breed and temperament. So this is why it's nice to have a puppy class. So my next puppy class is on my comments. It, um, what I did in my last puppy class, we, I temperament tested all the dogs, and then I determined which dogs needed what, and which dog, and I t educated the owner on, ahead of time what's gonna happen later on, and what method of training they're gonna have to use. So it's important to know your dog's temperament. If he's shy, you're gonna need to get him around a lot of people. If he's fearful, you're gonna need to expose him. If he's companion, you, can, you don't have to use treats. You can just do your obedience. If he's strong-willed, you're gonna have to follow through. If he's dominant, you're gonna have to use treats to teach him the concept, and then you're gonna have to teach him respect, and we're gonna have to teach him submissive if he's young. So this is why it's imperative to know the dog's temperament, to know what method of training you're gonna use. I forgot it was Wednesday. I missed the alert, because I'm working. It's more important that you work, Tori. Uh, and then I want you to go back to my replay if you have any questions about this. No shot collars before five months. Now, when I say shot collars, I also am throwing in the underground fence as a shot collar. A dog's brain tells them to run away from danger. They'll get shocked and they'll run away. Now, the problem is you're teaching this dog at a young age to run away from stress. It's not good. I have them come in my facility and they're afraid to walk in my facility because they think they're going to get shot. Because anything new could shock them. So be very, very careful to use any kind of shock collar on their neck under the age of five months. That includes remote and that includes underground. Now, I know some dogs it's, it's fine with. I know some dogs have done really good in it. Stay in the side of air, people. Stay in the side of air. You don't want to gamble with your dog that way. All right? The 50% the, 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 the is good, but the other 50%, oh boy, that's not good. I'd rather stay in the side of air, all right? What's your opinion on halty gentle leader collars? I like them, Angela. I first teach them not to pull, and then I go to the gentle leader or halty. That's one of my main go-to collars because if I have one that goes around their neck, their brain tells them to fight me. Any dog, their brain tells me to fight me. So I first get them off leash, I teach them not to pull, and then I go to the halty. So yes, yes, Angela, I do go to that. Good question. Yes, I was going to ask the same, Angela. I do. When I go into training methods, I'm going to give you all my secrets, damn it. You're going to know them all. I don't have a problem with that. I wish I'd have done this 10 years ago. I don't have a problem with telling you everything that you guys need to know. I'm, I'm going to be getting the most difficult dogs anyway, so it's okay. So I want, you're going to know anything around their neck, they can be, it can be interpreted as a challenge for a strong-willed dog, he'll fight it. For a dominant dog, he'll fight it. You put a head halter on him, he has no way of knowing what you're doing. You, where the head goes, the body follows. But if your dog doesn't know how to off-lead heel or doesn't know how not to pull, that head collar is going to cause stress, too much stress around their spine because they're turning their head. And you don't want that to happen. And you don't want that to happen because then you have other issues. You have other issues. All right? Very, very important. Uh, let me make sure I didn't miss anybody. 
you, making sure. I'm gonna go back here in a minute because I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back because I'm getting uh, flooded with, uh, with messages. But if I miss you, how do you stop destructive chewing on furniture when he's still working on the crate training due to someone else's mistake? You manage him more. Uh, he's learned a bad habit. You got him a little later, uh, Kelly. You got a lot of the times. I tell people it's an honorable thing to get a dog. You know, uh, when you rescue a dog, it's honorable, but it does come with some, some, uh, somebody else's mistakes. And this is why I try to educate people. Th these are free shows. They can go on my website and learn it. It doesn't matter. if you, you don't have to have any money to watch the show. You can watch it, and you can raise the puppy the right way so, so we don't get them in rescue groups. We don't get them at shelters abused. We don't get them in shelters hand shy. We don't get them in shelters not knowing how to chase a ball. We don't get them in shelters because you can't manage them the right way. The information's out there, people. I don't, it's out there. Please share it with people so we don't get that. That's my way of educating people. Uh, thank you for this. This is former dog catcher Hera. Yes, you are. I do remember you. Who, I, I, I talked to you about that, Sanera. Very, who isn't doing the best job at training her own. I learned so much from your class years and years ago. Yes, that, that was a really, really good uh, presentation I did for you guys in Colorado. Uh, how do you prevent hard leash pulling? If it's a puppy, let him leash pull. Let him pull on the harness. Just let him have fun, Ellen, right now for the first as a puppy. You don't need to do any of that stuff. And he's, You'll have plenty of time for stressful training. Just mold this puppy to enjoy life and love life. Um, find its purpose in life, uh, not, not, uh, not develop stress around humans. That's our goal. Okay. Again, I don't mean to sound redundant because some people that when I go do talks around the country, there's a talk that I do called finding your life's purpose. They're like, I don't know. I don't have a purpose. I don't know what my purpose is. I said, right now, be kind and love. That's it. Be kind and love. When that happens, your purpose will come in. And then I give them a sheet on what to look for, for their purpose. Pretty simple. But in the interim, for a puppy, just let him be happy. Let him chase a ball. Let him eat. Let him poop and pee two, three times a day. Let him sleep with you. Let him be nice to you. Crate training. Go to go to my crate training flyer and learn how to crate train so they don't get so they don't get traumatized when you abandon them inside the crate. Remember, putting them in the crate is punishment. Even with if you if you don't if you don't want them to go in there or not, it's still punishment because they they're abandoning you. You're abandoning them. And they, they, they disconnected from you. So it's, it's very hard. Uh, let's see here. Boy, I sure love the hearts, you guys. I really do. I appreciate this. Uh, okay, let me look under instincts. Know your puppy something. No shock. Uh, that's the last slide. That's the last slide to this. I, if I, you have any questions, let me go back to my, let me go back to my questions here. Uh, my puppy is too small for her harness. Only four pounds. Slips out of it. They both fight the collar and leash. Any other ideas? Um, what I would do then, Megan, Megan uh, Perko Smith, is try to go to an enclosed area that's fenced in and just let them roam free if they're too small. There are cases where the, the dogs are too small. The teacup chihuahuas, they shouldn't want to get too far away from you. But just go to an enclosed area where they can't get out and just let them be puppies. It, it's, you, know, you don't need that big of an area anyways. But, uh, I mean, you could even get a, um, a puppy pen and put it in the backyard. And then for potty training, just put the puppy, the puppy inside the puppy pen and just let it run around. Uh, I've had to do that, and that works, that works quite well. Uh, so kind off topic, but I'm struggling trying to clip my, my Roddy's nails. He's totally fine when we play with his paws while eating and chewing. Uh, Megan, Rottweilers handle stress with aggression. Their nails are extremely painful. Uh, Megan, if, if this is important to you, then go ahead and ask the question. It doesn't, it's not off topic uh, because I don't want you to go hands on. My suggestion is to take it to a groomer. They put it on the grooming table, make it a little off balance. They put a uh, thing around the neck, keep the head up, and they cut the nails. Um, and they, because they deal with dogs like that so much, they could also give you some more tips. Um, you cut a dog's nails and you and it's very very painful and if a dog handles stress with aggression it ain't gonna let you do it again they're not very forgiving okay and so you, you're gonna have a fight for your life uh, another thing that you can do is start running them on the cement because that naturally files them down 
um, or the tennis courts. The problem with cement and tennis courts is make sure their paws are not wet because if their paws are wet, you're gonna, you're gonna um, peel the skin off their paws. Uh, just, just do it just far enough when they're dry so when they're running, it just peels off and it, and it, um, and it files down the nails. But, uh, don't, yeah, don't, don't. If you guys have an important issue that the topic that's not on, please go ahead and say something, you guys. Uh, do you use a crate for timeout to correct any unwanted behavior? Um, Charlie, I would use a crate for management um, for instead of timeout. That's just a label that we put for the dog. Regardless of why you put him in there initially, they could think it's punishment. Because you're, why, why? Because you're abandoning them. So if I have friends that come over and, and, and they have little kids, and the little kids are not as well under control as you want them to be, I put my puppy in the crate. Well, my puppy thinks I have abandoned it, I've punished it, but my intent was to manage it. So it, don't look at don't look at what your your um, how your how your intent is. Look how the puppy is going to interpret it. So yes, it is good to uh, to do that. However, dependent on the unwanted behavior will determine what you do. So for example. If your dog is chewing all the time, then maybe you should give it some chew toys. Maybe you should put it in a crate with chew toys. Maybe you should play with it till it gets tired and then put it in a crate. Because maybe time and circumstances don't allow you to watch the dog. You're busy. Right now, while I'm doing this show, my dogs are in the crate. One of them's in the crate, the other two are in the basement. So I'm managing them. Am I, do they feel abandoned? Yeah, They're like, what the hell, dad? You're supposed to be playing with me right now. but. But again, this is how you manage it. You're welcome, Megan. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, let me make sure I don't have any other questions. I'm going to go through all of them. Might take a minute. Uh, Dawn, th uh, thanks for watching. For me and Tucker. Tell Tucker, give Tucker a bone for me, would you? Uh, coming to see you on the 26th, says Ann. Yes, Ann, I think I remember seeing you on my schedule. Uh, let's see here. Why, why didn't I look into your website and videos before? Dog mom fail. No, it's okay. That's my job. You got too much on your plate, girl. You moved to Germany. You got married. And now you're going to have kids, I hope, right? And then the first boy is going to be named Hector, right? I'm kidding. <laughs> it's all right. They're on there. My website. And then um, I'm going to be posting these, these uh, Facebook uh, live shows on YouTube, but not yet. I got a plan to do a few things. So bear with me. Uh, Jessica, my puppy follow commands. Okay, I talked about that one. Dude. Man, you guys are great. Great audience today. I'm talking great questions, great, um, great feedback, great topic. I want to use this, um, I want to use this video, this playback for people that want to do my puppy class so they can come in back and watch this and then they can, they can, uh, they already have a lot of the things that their questions answered and more importantly for the people who who uh, who have puppies who are far away I get I got a lot of people from from California and uh, I think it was Texas my last time that we're watching it mostly and those are just helping people all the way around the country helps a tremendous amount uh, let's see here almost done here before I go back to the new questions that I get just want to make sure I answered everybody's question and not setting them up. All right, let me go back to the beginning. Sonia, you're watching. You have a puppy, Sonia. I don't remember if you have a puppy or not. But if you do, go back to, uh, to my replays. You can watch the rest of the puppy thing. Uh, Casey, great info. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Casey. Lisa Schultz, thanks for watching. Uh, for, the guys who, for the guys and gals who just came on, go back to my replay. You watch the whole show. Uh, I talk a tremendous amount about how raising the right puppy. Um, there's one thing that I have to do some research on, which is raw food for puppies. I don't know when to start them. Um, and so I'm going to find out. That's some little tidbit for me. And that's what I know I have. And if you have any other questions aside from that, Jessica uh, Rogers Leonard, you're welcome, Jessica. You're welcome. I'm glad you're, you're watching this. I, I got a good turnout, so I appreciate that. Uh, most of my, uh, my uh, views are on replay, so share this with your friends. Share it with your family who's going to get a puppy. Why? Because I don't want these puppies ruined when they get older. 
I don't want them to be afraid of men. I don't want them to. And, and, and again, this, this helps us, especially if you're a guy with an anger problem, that we learn other tools other than our hands. All right, that we learn to be emotionally mature, to, to, to ask for help, to look for other resources, to not go to hands-on, to not get mad. That, that, takes, that takes a lot for us men to do. All right? I, I didn't get emotionally mature until I got in my 40s. I'm being deadly honest with you. All right? So I wish I would have done it a lot earlier. But it's important that we, when we don't know something, we get mad and, or frustrated. We internalize it and get frustrated. Our job is to find solutions. Our, our job is to find ways that don't deal with violence, that, that don't deal with anger. All right? so, and that's why it's important that when you have a puppy, you, you, you restrain yourself from being angry. You restrain yourself from being upset. And it carries over because we lead with emotions. If we're mad at the puppy for pooping in a house, now we could be mad at our a significant other. And they have nothing to do with that. And really, the puppy, he's just going, he's just doing what he comes natural. His brain doesn't tell him to go outside. We have to teach him through habit. So it's very important that happens. All right. So now, I'm, uh, my dog has been on the raw since six months of age. I have a distributor out of Ohio. Uh, six months. So can they go younger than that, Charlie? Can they, can they start at, let's say, eight weeks, ten weeks? Kat Gonzalez, thanks for watching. Sandy, thanks for watching. So go back to my replay. I'm about ready to go because I, I, uh, I have an appointment coming up. But it was an outstanding hour today. Next week, next week's show is on puppy training with treats. My last, my last puppy class, I took a bunch of video for this show. It's going to be a good one. It's a funny one. I had some really great puppies, you guys. So... Next week on puppy training, how to make him sit, how to make him down, how to make him heal, how to make him come. Give you some good tips on using treats. Very, very important so you can utilize treats. And remember, use the dog food for treats. Dog food for treats. If Wendy, you just got here, Wendy, go back to my replay and watch the show. Any other questions, go to my website for flyers um, or message me on Facebook or my email, michigandogtraining at gmail.com. And if you have an important name, text me. I very rarely pick up the phone. I literally get sometimes between 25 to 100 phone calls a day. There's no way I can answer and listen to every message that I get. There's no way. So text me works well, email works great, and message works good. Yes, my call volume has gone down because of my flyers, but it's getting back up again. Yesterday, I got 57 voicemails come on people i can't answer all of them i'll spend all day on the phone so help help me with that help me with that all right if not we will see you good source and book lou nelson raw and natural nutrition thank you for that uh charlie i'm going to go to that and i'm also and I'm, th the fact that you have it on here i hope other people go back too all right if you don't have any other issue if you don't have any other issue we will let me uh look here do do we will see you next next week